Thank you very much for uh, the uh, the invitation and um, introduction. Um, so yes, um, my my talk is entitled "Data Publication: A Personal Tale" because it is it is one to be honest, and it could probably also be "Data Publication and Citation: A Personal Tale" as well because it kind of spans the whole um, uh, twenty year span of my of my scientific career so far. Um, but I don't want to um, give any any spoilers. I'll just get straight into it. So. Um, a long, long time ago, back in the, uh, well, back in 1999, so 20-odd years ago, uh, fresh out of university with a degree in physics and music, uh, I started work for the Radio Communications Research Unit at Rutherford Appleton Laboratory in, the, uh, in Oxfordshire. Um, and I was brought on board to um, work with radio propagation measurements. Uh, so basically we had um, a receiver station set out in, a, in the car park of Sparshold Agricultural College in Hampshire with a load of re receivers inside. And we were listening to um, a beacon signal on Italsat F1, which was up in geostationary orbit. Um, and we were listening at frequencies that um, radio frequencies that are badly impacted by rain clouds and atmospheric gases, um, mainly because the radio spectrum is getting horribly congested and people want to have more um, bandwidth to be able to uh, do things like mobile internet and watch Netflix on the bus and that sort of thing, or at least they used to. So my job was to take the signal levels, as you can see in the graph on the left there, um, and process them and analyze them and turn them into attenuation statistics, which is what you got at the, uh, the right there. And that was, as you can imagine, quite an intensive process in terms of signal processing and analysis. Um, lots of different steps, lots of different computer programs, um, lots and lots of data. Um, and of course, attention to detail was a, a big part of the job, right? So um, that's what I did as my first proper job outside of university. And of course, this being back in the early noughties, um, let's just say that it was a lot, things have improved when it comes to data management and data archiving over those years, which is great relief. Um, I kind of like showing off these photos because it's, um, you wouldn't store your data in CDs on a shelf in your office anymore, thank God. People don't do that anymore. Um, that was the archive. Um, we had the raw data in um, and, and process data as well on a server as well. But it was kind of like um, you look at the files and go, what do those file names mean? And then you figure out that you can actually open them in a text editor and you go, what do those numbers mean? So, yes, of course, I knew all about it because I was working with these every single day. Um, but yes, um, it's a bit of a, a headache when it comes to the data management side of things. We had documentation, of course. Uh, the key thing to note in these workflows, these are just images. I don't have the Word documents that these workflows are in anymore. They name the, um, the IDL files that were used um, and the software file names. And it's a case of, well, I haven't used IDL in a decade at least. Um, so um, of course there's no chance that those files would be backward compatible in the slightest, but there we go. But we had the workflows. Um, we had documents, so these were the project reports. Again, um, they suffered from being um, not being backwards compatible. So when I came to first put this talk together, I couldn't actually find the Word documents. None of the pictures came through for the, the figures. They weren't showing in the Word document. Um, so I literally had to line up the, um, the full, not the folders, the, the hard copies of the project reports and take a photo of them on my office floor. Of course, we wrote papers. Um, they're in the paper. The, so our first one was in radio science back in 2006. And you can ask yourself, well, where was the data in this particular, um, for this particular work and for this particular um, piece of um, publication? In this case of many, many years worth of data wound up being condensed and summarized down to into what was effectively one table, right? Um, so yeah, there was an awful lot of work that went into just publishing that one table. So the next question is, um, and I'm quite happy to put my hands up and answer this one. The question is, was my research and data fair, inter findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable? And I can safely say that no, it absolutely wasn't, right? And I will put my hands up and say this. Um, but 
I love PhD comics, by the way, highly recommend them. Um, the comic at the top then really does summarize the struggles that a researcher has to go through when they're dealing with creating data sets. It takes forever to collect the data, to interpret it, to uh, write about it, and then it all gets distilled down to one slide. Um, and it doesn't, that one slide doesn't necessarily get the appreciation it deserves, right? Anyway, another very important thing in my career that, uh, um, that set me on the path to which I am today was I got scooped. I shared the data sets that I'd been working on for years and years um, with another research group. I sat down with them and um, explained to them how I did what I did and what all the, uh, all the files meant and what the analysis analyses were and all the rest of it. Um, they published the first results using that data and they didn't give me a co-author credit and I didn't get a personal acknowledgement. I think we got a group acknowledgement but um, but there we go and I'm sure you can imagine how I felt like that um, and I think this picture from the Lego academics um, pretty much sums it up. Um, so yes, so as I said that had a great impact on my career um, and my personal career um, but not from the way you'd expect. Um, you would think that um, it would have a, a damaging effect on my career being scooped, but actually what it did was encourage me to look into ways that we can actually give researchers uh, and the people who create data the proper credit that they deserve for um, the work that they do, because data is, uh, science is all about data and it's getting more and more about data nowadays. Um, so, uh, basically, going back to first principles, science should be reproducible, right? If it's not reproducible, there's a very big question to ask is, is it actually science if it's not reproducible? Not really. Um, of course, working with environmental data sets, um, we can't reproduce observational data. We don't have time machines. We can't be nip back to last week to take a measurement that we didn't manage to collect the, at the time. So. Um, but uh, it's not just observational data. Um, with an awful lot of data, you need to have access to the collected data to confirm that the science is valid because poor data analysis generates false facts and false facts and inaccessible data, well, your science because loses all its credibility. Um, we need to be able to check and verify the results that we've got. Okay, um, so so one of the things that people say um, is that, well, we can encourage people to make their data open and that makes it accessible and that will allow all the verification of the science. And there's been a lot of pressure from the UK government or other governments to make data from publicly funded research available for free. And this is this is generally a really good thing um, because it allows for that fact checking and, and quality control and all the rest of it and reassures the research funders that they're getting value for money. Um, so, uh, and it also having open data allows the wider research community and industry to find out and use data sets and understand the quality of the data. The thing is, when you spend years of your life lovingly creating a data set, um, you don't just want to hand it over to everybody without any any um, attribution or or credit for all the effort you've put in. So we need to have reward structures and incentives for researchers to encourage them to make their data open. And that's where we started looking at data citation and publication, right? So um, there's a distinction. It, you think it's a, it's a uh, an on off switch. It's data is either open or not or um or it's published or not there's uh, there's actually multiple access going on there um because when we think of publishing we think about publishing in terms of the academic publishing model where papers that have been published in an academic journal are um have other aspects of them um associated with the publication in that journal so um in publications we are thinking of things Publishing with a capital P is making something public after some pro formal process which adds value for the consumer. So in the case of academic publishing, um, the formal process that adds value for the consumer is the peer review and the commitment to persistence. And also to a certain extent as well nowadays, the filtering um, and the, uh, the quality assurance of the results that are and work that are being published in, in the journal itself. Um, 
Of course, we want to encourage researchers to make their data open, persistent and quality assured. Um, it's a di bit difficult to figure out how to do that quality assurance, but we can do it in multiple ways. It's through scientific peer review, or we could also do it through repository management managed processes. But basically what it comes down to is that researchers are used to publishing things. This is a normal operation. It's a normal thing that they're expected to do and is part of the way they do their work. If you ask a researcher to make their data shareable and open, sometimes you can get quotes vaguely along the lines of this. I'm all for the free sharing of information, provided it's them sharing their information with us. And before anyone thinks that I'm um, kind of attributing this quote to um, someone in particular, I'd just like to say that this is a quote from um, Mustram Ridicoli from the Terry Pratchett books, uh, who is also a very well-known academic, but uh, it kind of sums up on the thinking that some researchers have when it comes to talking about open data. Now, the thing is, if you're talking about open data, there can be some resistance. If you're talking about data sharing, there can be some resistance. But if you're talking about publishing data, that makes it easier for people to, um, for researchers to get their heads around because um, they're used to publishing, as I said. Right. So it used to be easy, in inverted commas, to publish data. There's examples here. Um, 1665, um, Robert Hooke um, and his sketch there of the uh, supercells and mimosa leaves. Yeah, it is mimosa. And then there's other examples there. The scientific papers of William Parsons III, Earl of Ross, back in uh, 1800 to 1867. And those are data sets, right? They are the sort of data sets that were collected during those time periods. The problem is now we don't collect data sets that size anymore. We can't publish them in hard copy. And here is a classic example. Um, so many years ago in the Wellcome Trust in London, or Wellcome Collection in London, they had the entire human genome printed out and bound into books. And that um, shelf is taller than I am, and I'm 5'10", um, and full of very heavy books with very thin paper and lots of teeny tiny letters. This is a fascinating object to um, show just how big the human genome actually is. But in terms of actually doing research on it, it's pretty much useless. You, you cannot, a human cannot read it and understand it and figure out what's going on. We need computers and machines to be able to do that for us. And this is a good example of just how, how big data sets have gotten over the years. So you can say to yourself, well, all right, I'm a researcher. I've spent years of my life lovingly curating and making a data set. How do, how do I do this data publication thing anyway? Um, well, can I not just shove it up on a web page or somewhere on, stick it into my institutional repository? Um, there's, there's lots of options and sometimes researchers get a bit bewildered. Um, I mean, the easiest thing is to stick it in, um, in, a, in the cloud somewhere. Um, Amazon Cloud, Google Cloud, Dropbox, whatever. The problem with that is um, how do you know it's still going to be there when you come back 20 years from now? Um, then that's the same for the websites as well. I've seen in my in my career plenty of project websites that have been running and looked after for as long as the project has been. But as soon as the, the project ends, if the website falls over after the project ends, that's it. It's gone completely. No more. So you can also publish data by um, publishing it as supplementary materials in a journal paper. But again, that's not ideal for most um, for most data sets because they're, again, they're too big. Um, and also there's issues with discoverability in supplementary materials too. Um, putting it in a disciplinary inst or institutional repository is actually one of the better ways to go about doing it. Um, but then um, it depends how, how much of a reach those um, repositories actually have and to whether or not people actually know to go looking for your data set there. Oops. Um, so the thing that was mentioned at the last there was data publication in a data journal. So um, I'll very quickly go over what a data journal actually means. So we've got the traditional data journal, online journal up the top, the author writes a paper, the journal and the reviewer reviews the paper and we don't entirely know where the data set actually is. It's somewhere around the place with a overlay journal and I and this model more and more journals are actually um, taking for their um, articles even without being official descriptor 
articles, journals or data journals, um, there is a greater pressure to actually have links to the data or the data provided to the reviewers um, before um, uh, before the before the article gets sent out to review. Uh, some journals mandate that the data be made available um, before the paper is, is published as well. Um, so there is more of a growing awareness in the academic publishing community about the importance of that data and um, journal linking, which I think is a really good thing. So I mentioned descriptor articles. What What is a descriptor article? Um, uh, it basically is something that describes it's an article that describes a data science output where that output could be anything from a data set software code infrastructure hardware um, as of interest to the data science community um, or the community um, that of the journal that the uh, descriptor article is being published in um, descriptor articles allow researchers to publish their data sets uh, in a way without having to necessarily have the um, novel analysis or groundbreaking conclusions resulting in it. It's the, the, the thing, the object is presented as is with the view of giving it to the community or making the community aware of it and its usage so that the community can then go and, um, and use it and take advantage of the fact that it exists and they don't have to be recreating a data set that already exists, for example. The descriptor article is also a really good bit of human readable metadata. Um, it's all about uh, when, how, why this object was created and how it can be of use to the wider and often multidisciplinary community. And um, the benefits of having um, descriptor articles for data sets and codes is that um, you get that quality control and checking. Um, there's the peer review of the output. Uh, you can publish the output a lot quicker. Uh, as soon as you finish um, creating the data set, you can publish about the data set. You don't have to wait for the um, for the novel analyses to be done. And it provides they provide attribution and credit for the um, the creators of that data data object or data um, sorry data science output. Um, and also as well, it makes it easier for people to find what those things are, understand them, and and how to be uh, sure of their quality and provenance as well. So um, uh, it's it, descriptors are, are handy thing, handy thing to have. And um, as it says in that image there, peer review or it didn't happen. So uh, just diving a little bit deeper into this whole notion of um, usability, trust and metadata. Um, metadata is absolutely vital for data sets as well, because to a certain extent, data sets are a lot less human readable than they um, than journal papers are. When you read a journal paper, you can do a quick skim through read and get a quick understanding of the quality of the paper. There are there are red flags that you you get to learn. The thing with the data set is oftentimes you don't you might have to be downloading many gigabytes or even more of a data set to open it and actually see if it's any good. And then you can find yourself in the situation of opening up a very large spreadsheet and going, okay, I've got an awful lot of numbers here. What do they actually mean? So in order to kind of help guide readers and researchers into understanding the quality and usability of um, the, the data set, that's when the metadata comes in and a few other proxies for quality as well. Um, do you know the persons who create or the people who created this data set? That's that's generally a good sign. Personal personal reputation is good. Um, can you can you trust them? Do you trust the data source of the repository? Did you find it through a random Google search and it's um or is it from a from a trusted source that you know? Um, and then this is really important as well. Is there enough metadata so that you can understand or and or use the data? Um, that's really important. The first step is always look at the metadata because if you have, if you can't figure out what um, the data set is all about from reading the metadata, then you're likely to not be able to use the metadata or use the data set at all. And I've got a an example this over there um, on the right, which is the complete metadata from a published data set. Right, that is all of it. The metadata is completely contained in that short bit of three lines. Rain CSV contains rainfall in millimeter for each month at Marysville, Victoria from January 1995 to February 2009. 
Um, right, so that was useful information in there. I mean, you've got the dates. Um, I'm not entirely sure where Marysville, Victoria is, but I could probably find it out. Um, but yeah, it's that's the sort of information and the sort of metadata um, which is useful, but there could be so much more and make it so more so much more useful to people as well. So um, going back to the open science, as I said, there's people conflate openness and published, and it's not necessarily the case. You can make um, your data sets open um, in a way that makes them completely unusable, right? And this is a very, very good um, quote from a very, very good blog post that I, I highly recommend going and checking. But it's basically listing all the ways that a researcher can comply with the open access mandate for their data, while at the still same time making their data sets completely, totally and utterly unfair, right? Um, and yeah, not fair in the slightest. And it's just to be aware of the fact that openness is valuable, but it has to be open in the right sort of way. Um, and then, of course, there's the question of, well, should all data sets be open? Um, and we tend to, I tend to default to as open as possible, as closed as necessary, because we are always going to have situations where um, we have um, data sets that shouldn't be open for very, very good reason. Things like confidentiality issues, people's health records, um, conservation issues. You don't want to be making the locations of um, of polar bears or, or rhinos freely ava available on the website for poachers, for example. And then, of course, there's um, security issues and health related issues. Uh, you don't want methodologies for building biological weapons just where anybody can go and download them. But for the most part, those are the edge cases, the most most data should be um, be open and be made available for, for people to use because it imp increases the impact of the data and of the research as well. So um, it's important to remember that when you're talking about data citations, um, not you can have things that are citable that are not open, right? Just like you can cite a paper that's behind a paywall, you can also cite a data set that isn't open. And actually, it's really valuable, even if you can't open your data set, it is really valuable to make your data set citable, because the simple act of making it citable tells people an awful lot of things, potential users, an awful lot of things about the data set itself. So the act of making a data set citable tells people that the data set exists, who's responsible for it, where people can find it, um, a bit about the metadata associated with that data set, things like title, abstracts, creators, dates, oftentimes abstracts associated with it links out to publications that use that particular data set. Um, and these all are inf important information that is valuable to the researcher, even if they can't actually download or read the, um, the thing themselves, whether that's the data set or the, uh, the article. Um, and basically citation also gives benefits that encourage data producers to make their data open as well. Um, it provides that academic recognition and that credit too, which is really important. So um, having gone into the bit of the, the, the theoretical aspects, it's a case of what did I actually do with my data sets that I lovingly created and got scooped on? Uh, I'll tell you what I did. Um, I worked together uh, with colleagues in CEDA, the Centre for Environmental Data Analysis, and um, I archived all the data that I created in CEDA. And uh, all of those data sets now are frozen and they have a DOI attached to them, so they are properly citable. Granted, um, I was quite heavily involved in um, managing the project to get DOI minting for the, the NERC data center set up. Um, so, but that was a thing that needed to be done anyway, and that was a very good thing. So that was kind of pushing the whole notion of data citation forward a little bit more. Then as well, um, with when it came to data publication, um, I, again, so it wasn't the ITLSAT data set, it was the GBS data set, but a very similar project. Um, that was also deposited in the CEDA archive. And I wrote a data descriptor article, which was formally published in the Royal Met Sox uh, Geoscience Data Journal. Um, and I think it actually counted as the second paper that was published in the the geoscience data journal 
Um, and yes, I, I was also part of the team that launched that particular journal as well. Um, so we are now in the situation where data journals are a lot more common um, and a lot more popular, which I think is a really good and really valuable thing. Um, not only for the people who are getting the academic credit by publishing their data sets, um, but also for people to know what's out there and to be able to understand what's available and what they can use without having to go through the effort of, of collecting again. Right, so um, whistle-stop tour there, um, a quick summary and conclusions. I'm not going to uh, surprise anyone when I say to people, data are massively important. We need the data um, to be able to verify the conclusions and knowledge that are the result of scientific um, experimentation and, and investigation. Good day, good decisions meet, need mud. Good decisions need good data, as the saying goes. And if we don't have good data, we won't have good conclusions. Um, and that's fundamentally against what science is all about. Science is all about the reproducibility and the verifiability of the conclusions um, that come out of it, out of a research work. Um, Everybody has the responsibility to care for the data that we've got, that we've produced ourselves, and also for those that are produced um, elsewhere. Um, the data creators, we want to be able to tell the story of what we did to the data um, and make sure that it's transparent and that other people understand it. Not only so other people can use it, but also so if we come back to our particular data sets 20 years into the future, we'll have a good understanding of what they were and be able to remember what we did 20 years ago. Um, and also it's important to make that uh, that data production process, that analysis process verifiable so that, um, and understandable so that people will trust our results. And, and yes, I am very aware, I know from personal experience just how much hard work it is to actually do this sort of thing. It's absolutely fine. This is important work and we should be acknowledging it. Um, so there we go. Um, and I'd like to finish up with um, just some acknowledgements that uh, from, from my former colleagues from previous roles for the people with the Radio Communications Research U Unit, who are now the Chill Bolton Group in um, the Science and Technology Facilities Council, uh, the NERC Data Citation and Publication Project Team and the Prepared Project Team and also the CEDA Team. And I'd like to close with a very nice quote from Graham Steele, um, which is basically, publishing research without data is simply advertising, not science. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm happy to take questions now.